So our profitability hasn't changed a whole lot, really, because we have cattle with all fat cattle. What has helped, of course, has been corn since November of 2012, as, you know, for the most part, this is the March 2014 contract, so it's come down March 2014 contract. Um, what's interesting, and maybe it's not interesting, or if I want to look at it, since about the second quarter of 2011, this is Nebraska feed yard profitability, has been basically red for the better part of two and a half some odd years. I don't know if that pertains to everybody, because we wouldn't all keep feeding cattle if we're all losing money. But uh, the bright spots, if you call it a bright spot, this black line back up here said we're making money, and this week, the profitability net feedlot returns in Nebraska is about 230 bucks compared to the average of the last four years, which is losing 31. What does that mean? That must mean that we're going to have some contraction of cattle feeding, which we're starting to see. What I think that also means is cattle feeding is going to move north. And I think Iowa is certainly going to become one of the stronger cattle feeding states which is going to push some more fed cattle this way. Personal opinion. I don't know if that's absolutely correct, but I know it's moving out of Texas. Cargill showed us that, closing the plant down there. Probably moving out of Oklahoma. So what that means for us is we are going to be competing for a smaller group of feeder cattle with a potentially larger group of feeders in the northern part of the feeding belt. So, you know, just keep that in the back of your mind when we talk about this, because what that tells us is we have to become more efficient and we have the resources to do it. We have more feed sources available in this part of the world than any place else. Byproduct feed sources, off-grade feed sources, <coughs> silages, earlages, you know. It, just everything is working for us. We just need to find a way to make them all work. So what I'm going to talk about, like I said, maximizing efficiency. We're going to talk about limit feeding growing cattle, just like we talked about limit feeding cows. And really the same things pertain. Um, we're going to talk about quite a bit about food and I'm going to show you some projections. You know, some people will hold students and do one of these. I, I, I understand, but um, that's really what the money is. The most sure source of making a profit right now is in whole schemes if you can afford to deal with them. Um, there are special considerations. We're going to talk about technologies to try to help improve efficiency. And then again, we're going to touch on trace minerals, particularly chelates in feedlot diet. So launching right into limit feeding cattle. Limit feeding cattle is a strategy designed to reduce roughage needs, which is really where this was all generated from. We can cut back the amount of roughage in a growing diet, and in the corn belt, that's a benefit to us. Um, in doing so, we improve feed efficiency pretty dramatically, uh, both growing and finishing side. We're not restricting the finishing side, but we're improving efficiency. I do believe we reduce manure production because the organic matter is more digestible, so they're putting less back on the pen surface. Uh, we certainly reduce sorting because these cattle are feeding for six hours a day and they're not focused on sorting feed, they're working on eating. Um, and then I think it does simplify labor and feeding schedules because we have a program feeding system. Um, basically, we have how many pounds you feed each week or each month, however we set it up. And there's not a whole lot of variation from that. And so it does simplify some things, but it also increases your management because you have to be a much better manager of your feeding time and the feeding consistency. Um, the challenges with limit feeding, and I call this limit feeding, technically it's called program feeding. Um, so if you heard program feeding before, probably more appropriately. Um, we need at least 12, and I say very much at least 12, probably 18 <coughs> inches of bunk space to make this work ideally. Because cattle have to have access to the bunk all at one time. There isn't much feed there for them, and they need to all have access to go up to the bunk. Um, you need excellent pen management. As you start this out, cattle are hungry, and they do push the fence just a little bit. Not as bad as cows, but they push a little bit, and so we need to make sure our pens are in good shape. And then definitely adequate TMR mixing, because every bite that calf consume has to be the same as the next one. Um, because if we get out of line on starch, we get out of line on fat. Um, if we have some inconsistencies, you can cause some acidosis doing this because feed intake is rapid. Um, so the way I designed these programmed limit feeding systems, for example, those of you that work with me or have worked with me, uh, finisher one type of diet, um, moderate level of finishing roughage, 
And we limit that between 75 and 85 percent of ad libitum diet or dry matter intake. Um, and so, as a consequence, cattle have feed in front of them for you know six to ten hours a day, depending on uh, on the cattle. Now, well, I'll talk about that in just a second. So essentially, the concept behind this is we're growing cattle with a typical growing ration. We're using roughage to limit energy intake because we're simply providing more fiber, less energy. What we're doing here is we're actually limiting energy intake by limiting total pounds of feed that we provide to the cattle. As a consequence, limiting total calories per day doing the same thing. Um, what we're doing is we're saving the cost of the reference. We're saving some of the cost of feeding cattle. Uh, and, and essentially, just like we talked about with cows, we are making metabolic changes to the expensive organs such as the liver, the intestines, probably the heart just to a small extent. Um, and we're improving long-term feed efficiency, which is why this carries over onto the finishing side, because we're essentially shrinking all that organ mass, making cattle more efficient. So this would be an example, just a rough example of a finisher one program feeding type of diet. And, and as you can see here, we're somewhere in that neighborhood, I actually put it on here, it's about 14-15% roughage, um, with gluten feed as a major source of our feed corn and, and, and corn stalks. It doesn't have to be corn stalks, it can be grass hay, it can be whatever sort of roughage we want to use. Um, but in this case, it's a, you know, depending on your mathematics, it's a 60 NEG type of diet. So a fairly hot kind of ration that we're limit feeding. And what we provide you is a limit feeding, program feeding schedule. And in this case, we're starting cattle at 400 pounds. And we're providing you how many pounds of as fed into both dry matter and as fed intake per day. In this case, you can see we're limiting cattle to about 75% of their ad limited feed intake to target 2.8 to 2.9 pounds per day. Um, and as those cattle grow on a weekly basis, we are increasing feed until we reach whatever our target is, whether that's 850 or 9. Now, on the flip side of this, I have a counterpart in Nebraska who has actually started program feeding cattle, putting them at a level of intake at 500 pounds a unit. Never changing. So we're targeting about a six and a half weight calf, and we're overfeeding the four weight, we're underfeeding the eight weight. I haven't bought into that completely yet, but it does hold some merit, it's very simple. Um, and we get to the same point, more or less. My concern is we're overfeeding the, the younger, the lighter calf a little too much, and might make a little fleshier calf if we need to. But I think it's something that might be coming down the pike, and, and it might be interesting to look at here in the near future. But for now, I, I really like this strategy. Um, from limit feeding cattle, especially if you have any roughage challenges, especially if you're in a building. Um, so the protocol with this limit feeding system is we start cattle as normal, we start on the starter ration, and we work up through our transition rations until we reach that finisher one diet. And we let cattle eat as much as they want at that point. Um, the only change in there, oftentimes I'll limit feed starting cattle as well, so we can train those cattle to be more aggressive when they're younger. But we essentially work the cattle up there, and then we limit them back to 75% of ad lib dry matter intake. As I said, that we increase dry matter intake on a weekly basis, um, or every 10 day basis, however we decide to do it. We feed once daily in most cases, and as I said, feed's available for six to eight, maybe 10 hours per day, and that's the feed that those cattle have. And that's part of the way that we do some adjustment in this, in this strategy. If cattle only have feed three hours a day, then we know we're probably underestimating weight or underestimating the environmental conditions, and so then we have to move that up just a little bit. But predominantly, we're in that six to eight hour range. The best cattle for this system, in my opinion, I think it works phenomenal for heifers. Heifers are always a challenge to get enough legs underneath them to get them to hang a you know, 1,300 pound calf. And if we can limit feed cattle and really strictly control what goes into them, I think we can get a heifer much bigger than we would with a more traditional growing type of diet because they're probably a little bit in the hot side for some of those heifers. It is best designed for lighter weight cattle, the four and five weight cattle. If you try to start a six and a half, seven weight calf doing this, their organ size is probably already a little bit too large and they may not respond quite as well to this system, whereas a lighter calf is certainly going to. Um, it also works excellent for developing heifers. I know I've talked to a few of you in here about developing heifers. And what we found is that we can program feed heifers. And I'm doing this with a ranch out in South Dakota for the last two years, and we're very, very happy with it. 
we're essentially limiting those heifers to about 80% of their counterparts intake. We have a group of heifers that are heifers that they're going to sell, a group of heifers that they're going to keep. And the group of heifers we're going to sell are gaining about 1.8, the group of heifers we're going to keep, you know, our target's one, they're probably 1.2. Um, but it's working very well, and uh, the first year of breeding has been very promising. And so we're targeting during the winter about one pound per day, up until about 60 days or so prior to breeding, and then we let those heifers increase to 1.75 to 2 pounds a day, uh, somewhere in that neighborhood, and you know, get some sort of a flushing effect, if you will. And that's been very successful. And I think going back to our previous conversation this morning, um, we're improving long-term cow efficiency doing that. Again, we're shrinking that organ size a little bit, those expensive organs, and making them more efficient, long-lived cow. And as I said before, this works well in mature cows, um, as we discussed this morning. Um, so, any questions on limit feeding? It's a, it's a huge, broad topic, and I didn't want to go over the point too long, but I, I do think it's a very interesting concept and for a lot of people in this part of the world, the Corn Belt. Um, the world Belt is at a premium. It holds a lot of promise, provided we have enough bunk space. And you know, talking about buildings this morning, I, I think it really holds a lot of promise inside a building because we can reduce the amount of manure production in a building, provided we have enough bunk space, and uh, allow us to grow cattle more efficiently in a building. No questions, I'll move on to people. How many people feed Holsteins? Don't be afraid to raise your hand. <laughs> 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 Shouldn't be afraid to raise your hand, they're profitable. I mean, they, they really are. And if you do it the right way and you have the system set up for it, they can be a very attractive option. I know the challenge has been finding the right kind of cattle, and that certainly is a a challenge to find a nice, well-fed group of cattle that are going to come and, and really perform the way you want them to. You certainly don't want to buy the eight-way grass-fed Holstein. They're not going to make much money. Um, but if you buy the right kind, Kelly's going to talk a little bit for me about starting cattle um, because I'm not an expert in starting Holstein calves. I'd like to find somebody else. These are a couple of projections I ran, and I'm not sure if it's there to see in the back, but I ran these last week when I was putting this together. If you look at all this here, put on a TMR diet. I use irreligious diet, some a little hay, a little straw, some modified pistillage of 90 bucks. Jeremy in the, in the ballpark. Uh, it's probably a little low, but it's going to be in that 90 and 110 by the time we get it in. Okay. So maybe my numbers are a little low here, but essentially our cost of gain of these whole scenes, if you figure a three pound daily gain and seven and a half feet conversion, which to me that's a little uh, conservative on feet conversion, I think we can do better than that. Uh, but our cost of gain is somewhere around that $90, $90 cost of gain on whole scene, which is probably 10 bucks higher than beef gas because of our performance and efficiency, but there's still $200 worth of profit left from those gas. Buy Holstein, four way Holsteins at about sixty, and what's really our saving grace right now is they're only about seven bucks back of you know, ten bucks off the board, and so they look very good, um, provided we can get them on the week, and that's Kelly's job here in a little bit. Um, the other side of this, is, and Lyle asked me to put a slide, a few slides in here about self feeding Holsteins, which again works very well. The cost of gain just a little higher, we're about five dollars higher cost of gain on a self feeder, and, and as a consequence. Our profitability is you know forty dollars less, give or take. Um, but again, that works well. Challenge with self feeding Holsteins, I think, is the time they're on feed. We have to manage the rumen. Um, we have a lot more opportunities to cause some acidosis because they're on feed for 350, 380 days. And, and so, getting those cattle adapted to it correctly and limiting roughage intake, free choice roughage, and Holstein on self feeders is, is probably as detrimental as anything else we can do. Um, so. Just managing those two, uh, we can do a good job of eating Holstein either way. I stole this from another guy, it's another nutritionist. Um, I, most of these things are, are uh, probably common sense, but a few that I thought were interesting. More runny than plain, which if they're outside, those cattle stir up a ton of dust when they're outside, and that leads to some respiratory problems in Holsteins. Um, they are heat tolerant, but awfully cold and tolerant, so bedding Shelter is critical feeding holes if you got to have them inside or at least with some sort of protection. Um, and 
more chance for both the metabolics again, they come back primarily to those cattle being on feet so long we're going to damage the room a little bit. And they have suicidal tendencies. I thought that was pretty complicated. <laughs> The guy that's feeding them or the cat? I always thought that was sheep. <laughs> uh, my three commandments, if you will, of feeding healthy, is to buy healthy, conventional type of cattle. Conventional meaning they have not been fed a lot of silage, they have not been fed a lot of hay. They are a little round on the top and you buy them, which, turns, which means that they've been fed the way they should be. Um, those guys cattle work good. Get them to a finishing diet as soon as they can get there. 350, 400 pounds, those cattle should be on a finishing diet. Um, and if nothing else, make use of all the available technologies. Uh, implants, ionophores, beta agonists, those all play into making money on the Kelly, your slide's coming up in the next one. So getting started on the right foot, Adequate vaccination is key. I've had somebody one time vaccinate, 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 and then vaccinate for it, um, which is the key to keeping them healthy. The appropriate use of milk replacement, which I think Kelly's going to talk about, don't cut corners. The right start is essential. And then adaptation to a finishing ration. Do it in a controlled manner, but I want them there at 400 pounds. This is Kelly's. Um, so they have touched on quite a few points with those, with the calves, um, you know, getting them up on to as quickly as you can is important. Um, some common rule of thumbs that we have with calves, um, expect to double that calf weight from birth to weaning. Um, so you have a 90-pound calf, that calf should be 180 pounds when it is weaned. Um, expect to go through a bag of milk replacer for that calf period, which is 77 bucks right now. Weight prices are high and are going to continue to stay high. And then for the first eight weeks of life, we're going to see a calf weigh 120 pounds. 50 of those pounds are going to be before you actually physically wean that calf. The two weeks post weaning on that calf, that calf is going to eat 70 of those pounds. Um, so that comes out to be about five pounds a day uh, per grain, and you're going to, or they're going to consume very little hay. I'm going to switch over here. Um, and the other big thing with calves, you need to do one thing at a time. If you're going to wean, only wean. Don't. Um, be changing their uh, grain, their feed stuff, such as their grain, their starters. Um, if you're going to castrate, if you corn, vaccinate, implant, do that all before you do a feed change or um, actually physically <coughs> that calf. The calves are a lot more stressed. You think about feedlot cattle when we vaccinate and implant, they're off feed for maybe a day and a half, two days. Calves, it's going to be a lot harder on. Uh, milk feeding. So we try to do deliver the milk to the calf at about their body temperatures at 101 to 102. At cold temperatures like this, you expect to start mixing that milk replacer. Um, that water temperature is probably going to be closer to 130, 140 degrees. So that by the time you take it from the milk house or from the barn to that calf hutch, um, it's going to be right at 100 degrees. Try to do 11, 12 hour intervals again. Um, I recommend to stay on the bottles with calves. I know a lot of people like to switch them off to buckets because it's a lot easier to clean a bucket than a bottle. Um, keeping them on the bottle, um, we have what is called in a baby calf the esophageal groove. That suckling action will actually open that groove and allow that milk to go into the abomasum, which is where we want milk to go. Um, a lot of times with the bucket, um, it doesn't open that groove, so then some of that milk actually gets into the rumen, and that can also cause bloat um, issues, and that will kill calves as well. Um, milk bloat, and that's in uh, a couple slides here. Um, the other thing with buckets that I have a little bit of problems with, uh, those calves will dive into those buckets, they'll get milk up into their nose, there'll be milk proteins in the nose, and then that can lead to bacteria growth in there, and especially in the summertime, um, you can get a lot of respiratory issues that way. So that's a few of my reasonings of why keeping them on a bottle. I know that a lot of people will argue with me on that. Um, Cold weather, we've had a lot of cold weather this year, so we look at increasing the total powder ounces that go into those calf bottles from 10 to 12 ounces. We also have a fat ad pack that we'll put into the, um, into the milk replacer just to increase that total nutrient density. Um, calf coats are also another great thing. Um, up to three weeks of age, I'd recommend throwing a calf coat on. Uh, it's going to save you a lot of money. Same thing with water, you need to feed at body temperature. Feed it half hour post feeding. Uh, those calves will start learning to drink uh, water, warm water right away in cold weather. Um, it might take them a couple days, but they will get there. 
Um, try to do a noon time feeding. The more water, um, the better. We're going to increase our total starter intake. Water drives feed intake. Um, if you're having trouble with calves, um, not consuming that water, uh, you can also sprinkle a little dextrose or electrolytes in there as well. Um, again, get those calves on the starter as soon as you can. Introduce starter after a couple of days, start force feeding it a little bit. Um, the, the biggest thing that we need to do is always keep them at feed fresh. Make sure um, you have your, your milk and your grain in two separate spots so that calf actually physically takes its head out of its milk pail and has to walk over here and allows that saliva and any milk and any extra water to drip off as it's walking to that grain because anything that gets put into that bucket is going to mold. Um, calves will not eat moldy feed and if you keep highly fresh feed on top of moldy feed, it'll eventually come through and those calves will smell that and they won't eat. Um, so that will decrease your starter intake. Um, when are calves ready to wean? When they're consistently eating four to five pounds of grain. And usually we say about three days worth, go ahead and get those calves to wean. Starters, 18% usually work pretty good. Um, with 22, you can go use on your first three weeks on calves. Um, it'll work pretty good, but there's a, there's a lot of different starter types, and I'm not going to get into that. Um, again, cleanliness is going to be the biggest thing for calves. Um, keeping the water pails clean, keeping the milk pails or milk bottles clean, um, preventing any of that mold. Um, the milk replacer will actually cause a black mold around some of the rings of, of buckets and a milk replacer bottle, or the milk bottles, and that'll actually cause sickness in those calves, too. Um, the Clostridia bugs, we talked about the milk going into the room, and um, in some cases, there's these Clostridia bugs are in, in that um, avenues and in the room, and, and they'll actually cause a sudden death. Those calves will blow it up, they'll scour, and they're dead. Um, so if you actually get into um, in with a dairy herd, there are um, some dairy birds that are vaccination vaccinating for Clostridia. Um, so that does help, and there's actually a couple of things you can do on farm to, to help prevent this um, sudden bloating. Guaranteed um, that you're going to have crypto in calves for the first three weeks of life, so we do try to prevent that. Um, there are a couple strategies that we can do for that um, with DECOX M, which is a water-soluble DECOX. Um, whenever calves are scouring, we need to keep them hydrating. That's the number one. Usually calves can make it through scour so as long as they're hydrated, whether you're force feeding electrolytes through a calf tube, um, through milk, uh, a milk bottle, or what we call a lactating ringer. Basically, you're taking a 1,000 milliliter fluid bottle um, and you're putting 500 milliliters in the one, each side of their neck, and that'll actually, that fluid, it'll look about the size of a softball in that little calf's neck, but eventually it'll be soaked into, that, into their body and they'll actually retain their hydration and that'll actually keep keep them alive. If you can get them through that, um, that's, that'll help quite a bit. Um, the vaccination program, I won't touch on this. Consult your vet. If you can get in with a herd, a good dairy herd that's doing a really good job uh, vaccinating their dry cows, um, that's the best thing that you can do. A dry cow vaccination program is very important. Regardless of anything, um, do some nasogen or enforce on all, all your calves when they come in. Um, some of the basic costs, I talked about feed, how much feed that the uh, first eight weeks of life they'll use. Um, transition them um, to a, from an 18% starter diet to a grower diet, and then again into a, a just strictly the grower diet. Um, there's a lot of numbers here, but I'm just going to try to keep moving for the sake of time. When we're looking from birth to about 400 pounds, we're looking right now at $189 to raise that cap on a feed cost. $77 for the milk replacer. Um, your 18 cap, I think, is like nine, 10 bucks a bag. Um, and then the, the grower, all that is, is a high protein pellet um, mixed with 34 grower. And then uh, when we're looking, talking implants, we say implant that cap day one that you get it. Um, and then come back seven days later and again implant it with a rail girl. And that's going to cost you roughly three bucks. There we go. Um, so the biggest variable is your calf price. Those calf prices move up and down all the time. It's kind of a moving target. Um, I looked at equity yesterday. They had a range of $140 to $200 for their calf prices. So um, I know some people were getting maybe about $100 for their calves, so it is a moving target. Um, I know, 
at one point, you know, we were looking only at 50 bucks for a calf and, and less than that, but uh, they're in, they're a hot commodity now, so I think that's probably what's driving that price. By the time you get your calf price, strictly your feed, only your feed and implants, you're looking at about $360 for your feed, um, your labor and your vaccination program. That's up to you. Uh, vaccination, I've heard anywhere from 16 to 20 bucks for a vaccination program on a calf. And if it's going to save a calf, it's probably worth spending, going on the higher end to try to make sure that you save that calf. And labor, I guess whether you're doing it or you're having your kids do it, but you pay your kids, uh, room and board, I guess that's in there too. So. So if you want to do cold weather research, that's a place to do it. But 
you guys have experienced pretty close to the same thing this year. Um, and then wind protection also is critical. Um, so moving away from feeding strictly dairy beef, and we'll talk about some of these technologies. I don't think any of these are new to anybody. Everybody's using preventive at some point, I would guess. Everybody's probably seen an implant before, and everybody's probably heard of Everybody's probably, probably heard of Zomax too, we can't get it, so we're not going to talk about it. Um, Iona Ford is a men's and Bogotech. The old data says a 4 to 7% improvement in feed efficiency. 4, especially with byproducts, becoming pretty much limited um, acidosis, subacute acidosis, using some of those higher fiber products. Um, but even at a 4% improvement in feed efficiency, that's still pays for it. It also controls coccidiosis to a minor degree, and it does help modulate and reduce some of the big variations in feed intake. It basically keeps those cattle a little more consistent. So it, it, it's important. Growth implants, there's two types of growth implants. The first type is a strictly estrogenic, which is sort of Encore or copy dose. Um, they're better than nothing, but there's something better than them. Um, combination implants are what's better. They're a combination of estrogen and testosterone, or more appropriately, estradiol and testosterone. Um, Revlor G, Revlor IS, Revlor XS, Revlor 200, and if we ever get them back, the Cinevex implants or the component <coughs> implants. We have some component implants. Some people have gotten some Cinevex. It's just slowly coming to the pipeline. And they keep on telling us by this spring we'll have it back at full strength. Actually, Pfizer, or Zoitis now, is building a new hormone plant in Lincoln, Nebraska to start producing their own implants in the States. So that should free up some Cinevex implants. And I think it'd be interesting for a lot of guys we probably all use this for more excess at some point. Cinevex has come out with a Cinevex, I don't know what they call it. It's basically a Cinevex Plus and it's coated. And so it's going the last 200 days like the Revlor XS does. Which should put some pressure on the Revlor XS market to bring that price down just a little bit. Or if nothing else, give you some more options. So be watching for that as it comes out. I think that's going to be interesting to see both. Um, so if you compare estrogen, estrogenic combination of plants, like I said, estrogenic is better than doing nothing. Um, estrogenic, based on the data, gives us about a 6.2% improvement in feed efficiency, where the combination of plants give us about a 10.5% improvement in feed efficiency. So you can see there's a difference. The economics, if we just plug this into a typical, you know, and this was probably three months ago, cost gain, $93 cost gain with no implant. That's an $88 cost of gain with a copy dose or an encore, and an $84 cost of gain if we look at a Revlor XS ISIS program. Um, so it does pay for itself. Um, putting that into a different perspective then, uh, dollars per head, no implant versus that combination, that Revlor product, gave us almost $100 a head by implanting cattle. I don't know who would turn down $100 a head. Um, not many people would do it. Now, there are natural programs out there, and I'm not saying they don't work, but if you're going to enter one, make sure you do the research and make sure you're getting paid back for not having that technology there. That's all I'm saying. Because oftentimes you don't get paid back for them. So just think about the critical. Uh, no implants versus an estrogenic implant. That's $55 a head, but if we go move from an encore to an excess, we're going to gain something somewhere around 44 extra dollars per head going from estrogenic to a combination program. So I imagine everybody's probably figured it out at this point. I'm trying to encourage people to use a combination implant program, and, and that's, that's correct. Um, they're more work, there's more labor involved with them because you've got to put more of them in, but uh, you're getting paid back for your labor. Um, real briefly, I want to run through a couple of implant programs, um, starting out with old schemes. I have two different options here that I use right now most frequently. Um, like Kelly talked about, we always start off with a Ralph Rowley for, or as soon as we can get the cap dry enough to put an implant in here. Um, we follow that up at around 300 pounds with the Revlor G. And the reason we're a little less aggressive with Holsteins is because most people are selling those on some sort of a choice grade program, and so we want to be a little careful so we don't take quality grade. And that's why we're a little uh, less aggressive here up front. We follow that up. In the first case, with a Revlor IS, followed by another Revlor IS. And this strategy is very conservative, it does a good job, but it also is pretty labor intensive because we're taking four implants into a calf. And anybody who's worked a thousand pound Holstein probably can tell me that they don't want to do that too many times. 
and then I can't argue with them because that's a lot of uh, abuse. Um, the other program, and, and I like this program, I'll preface it by saying that the Revlor XS in some cases causes some lowers and hostings after about 60 days here. If there is somebody here from work, I'm sure they'd argue with me, and I can't argue against them because it doesn't happen in every case, and I can't tell you why. But it's happened often enough that I'm just a little bit gun shy about it. But for people who don't want to reimplant cattle, this is what we do. And it gives us the same performance as this program. You can argue a little bit more performance. So those two programs to me are very effective. And the return on your investment for option one is about $13.5 for every dollar you spend. The return on your investment for option two, because you have a more expensive implant here, is about $9.20 every dollar you spend on these plants. This does not include labor. So if you're hiring a vet to do it, there's obviously you know, labor involved in that too. But those are pretty good solid numbers. On the beef side, um, I just want to point out that there's really one line. Um, it's pretty simple in most cases. A 650 pound steer, we can put <coughs> our excess in in most cases, and we can let them go. <coughs> and not have to reimplant. 650 is certainly the bottom end. Maybe, maybe one would be 700 pounds, but we can get by at 650. Uh, with a 900 pound steer, we put a Revlor 200 in, and we let them go. Um, if we have calves lighter than 650 pounds, if we're used to feeding four weights, five weights, I'll either use a Rev G or a Rev IS out in front of that to fill up that extra space, and that works out very nice. Um, and if I have a calf between 650 and 900, most typically we'll put a Revlor XS in. If they're, you know, if they're really good cattle, if they're heifers, and we want to push a little bit, we'll put a rev IS in the uh, So there are some differences in there, but those two programs work very well, and the return on your investment is between seven and twelve and a half dollars for every money beef cattle. Yes, sir. Are you using or recommending using excess on heifers too? I'm not really. I'm not going to say that in Europe. It's been done. Yeah, I've seen it done before. Yeah, I've seen it done before. Okay. Supposedly, about the same timeline that we have the Pfizer or Zoetis implant coming back, they're also supposed to be getting a Rebel XH out in the near future. They're working on it. I don't know what's taking so long, but it's supposedly coming as well. And what's the combination of the XS and XH? Is that it's, IS, it's ISS and then IH. And the only difference between an XS and an XH is the XH will have about half as much estrogen because the heifer still producing all that estrogen. So there's the chance of having a few more boulders putting in excess and heifer. Um, any questions on implants? Yes, ma'am. What's the difference between Revlor XS and Revlor 200? Revlor XS is about a 220 day implant. It's a combination of IS and X. The Revlor XS is a single implant. And it's 20 milligrams of um, estradiol and 200 milligrams of testosterone. Whereas there's a lot more hormone in the excess, but it's not as aggressive because it doesn't pay out as fast. And so the excess is, a, it, the S is coated, breaks down after about 110 days. And so basically it's just like putting an I instead of an S in them. And so the, I, the S portion of that compares to where the 200 would fit, the 200 just more aggressive. So I'll give you the actual question. Of course, phenomenal numbers. That is your question. So the active ingredient is the difference between the two? No, the active ingredient is the same thing. It's just the, the, uh, the concentration of the ingredient. They're both estrogen <coughs> and testosterone. Um, same chemical. But they're just a different concentration. I believe the portion of the excess has 18 milligrams of estradiol and 180 milligrams of um, testosterone, whereas the 200 has 20 and 200. So it's just a little bit more. But see, the excess has the IS in front of it, so it can last for 220 days, where the 200 only lasts for about 120 or 130. And the Cinebex S is coming on board? Is it competitive with excess? Uh, the Cinebex S really is not competitive with any of these because the Cinebex S is only progesterone. Um, and so the, it's probably, the Cinebex S was about the first implant ever to come out that wasn't uh, proud of. Um, but we're getting Cinebex Choice back. And Cinebex Choice would be very comfortable to, uh, we probably watch things in a little bit. That would be very comfortable to a uh, Rebel War S. And the Cinebex Plus is very comfortable to a Rebel War 200. 
it, it, it's really complicated. You need to throw a comp component, a length of implants in there, and I can't even begin to tell you what all those abbreviations mean because they have E, E, I, S, X, whatever. Um, but yeah, that's, um, if, you want, if you want me to write that down afterwards, I can scribble that piece of paper because it's a lot of any other questions on the implants? All right, we will, I think this might be the end of it. Uh, beta adrenergic agonists, um, Optiflex and Zilmax, primarily now Optiflex. They promote greater blood flow to muscle, increasing muscle mass and reducing fat. They work on the same system that epinephrine does. So think about a fight or flight response when something's scared, it shovels all the energy it can to the muscle so it can run away. Basically, this is essentially doing the same thing. It's shuttling a whole bunch of energy to the muscle, um, which shuttles it away from the fat in the end of the feeding period. Because as cattle mature, they slow down skeletal muscle deposition and fat deposition. So that's what we're trying to change. Zillmax, the way it looks, is off the market at least for another year. Um, you know, I don't know if it'll ever come back or not. If Tyson has its way, it probably won't. Um, the rest of us have a way of coming well. So we'll see who we'll see wins. Um, but Optiflex is out there, and I think, I'll show you some numbers here in just a second, I think we can do almost as much good with Optiflex as we could with Zilmax, very close. Um, we feed Optiflex legally for 28 to 42 days. Optimal window in my mind is about 30 to 35. But there's a very flexible feeding window. Reserves <coughs> up for 20 days, and you had to be off that second. Um, and that was pretty good data. The economics, which is what I want to point out, um, I'm recommending in almost every case to feed 300 milligrams of Optiflex because I think that gives us as close a return to Zomax um, as we can get. And if you look at a beef steer, <coughs> our added carcass profit, our, our returns are always better on the carcass basis. We don't get nearly the returns to these on the live basis. But we're about a $30 return on a carcass basis to Optiflex 300 milligrams. That's over the cost of the product. And we're, we were about $39 return on Zomax. Okay, so we're not there with Optiflex, but we're pretty close. Um, in the terms of a heifer, we get a lot less return on a heifer from Optiflex than we do in a steer, but it's about $15 return on your investment. With Optiflex, it was about $22 and a half roughly with Zomax. Now Holstein, our return is a lot more like a heifer, it's about 16 bucks at 300 milligrams of Optiflex. I will say though, I think that number's higher because there's only about two studies out there with Holstein because there just is not enough Holsteins to justify all the research. I think that number's closer to 20 bucks myself, but I don't have enough data to prove that. Um, so that's just my hypothesis. But uh, this product though has been, I think what has saved us well, not us, has saved the consumer up to this point because we're producing so many more pounds of beef off the calf. And that has pushed that up by 30 bucks per ounce. So right now, and I think I'd argue that's actually saving us a little bit too. I think we might get our price out of line if we sell a lot of those hundred or dollar fifty calves. You know, that's gonna start to get pretty expensive at the market. So and then we saw that it didn't last very long primarily because it's hard for the market. Um, but it's a good product. And there's a lot of misconceptions out there about all these technologies. And the primary is reduced carcass quality. Without question, we can reduce carcass quality using Alphaflex and Omax implants if we don't, do, we don't apply them the correct way. The correct way to apply them is because marbling is a function of days on feed. Marbling is a strange beast. It's determined early in life. If you early wean a calf and you put him on a finishing diet, he'll marble like crazy later in life. But it doesn't start to develop until those animals are old. As animals age, they marble better. Cows will marble tremendously better than the cows will. They're just not eligible for it because they're too old. Um, so what we need to do is we need to feed cattle longer and feed them heavier. And what we've found with all these technologies is we've pushed these cattle heavier at a younger age, and we're still selling cattle about the same age as we used to, and probably about the same weight. But those cattle actually need to be 50 pounds heavier, and they can get those additional 50 pounds efficiently. And so we need to put that additional 50 to 100 pounds on them in little grain just like they used to. But that's been the rub on these technologies is that we reduce carcass quality, and if we don't apply them correctly, we do. And, and that's been partially our fault. I, I think as nutritionists, we've, we've evolved with products like Optiflex and learn more about how to use them. 
know, the research didn't bear that out. Um, in the case of Optiflex, what we want to do is we want to feed cattle within about a week of our traditional finish date. And then we take those cattle an additional 21 days after their normal finish date because we can feed them heavier, yet we're being as efficient as they were in the preceding 21 days because we're putting on more muscle, less fat. Muscle is 70% water for muscle. Fat is 4%. So muscle is tremendously more efficient put on than fat is. And so that's what we do with Optiflex. When we do that, we can get to the right spot. Real briefly, I want to talk about trace minerals and feedlot diets. Um, we know that chelated zinc, copper, cobalt, manganese are all important for host health. And especially in the case of a lot of these Holsteins, I, the more I do this, the more I find a lot of incidents of lameness and hairy gill warts, etc. And there's good data out there to suggest that if we're aggressive with these along with iodine, um, we can really improve hoof health if we start early. The problem with these products is it's never a short-term fix, it's always a long-term fix. And um, there's also data I'm going to show here, just a couple of slides, that we can also improve gain and feed efficiency, either alone or in combination with the beta agonist. Now this is, this is in pro slide, don't tell them I stole it from them. Um, but I think it pretty much accomplishes all the goals. This is their recommendation. And you know, in here, actually, I would replace Impro 100 with Avail 4 and feed that for the receiving and the finishing diets. Um, their data shows, and, and I do believe this, I've seen enough of this now, that we actually have a nice improvement in average daily gain. This is just feeding zinc methionine. And, uh, uh, no, excuse me, this is Avail 4, sorry. This is feeding Avail 4. And if we figure available for costs us about three cents a day, and we gain an additional 0.19 pounds per day based on this, that's 27 cents a day added weight, um, which basically over a 200-day feeding period equates to about $48 profit feeding available for in place of some of our inorganic trace minerals, um, you know, over and above that three cents per day. Now this is some of their other data. And uh, they don't, we don't have good economics here. Just looking at this, we do also improve feed efficiency, about a 0.3 pound per day improvement in feed efficiency, again, feeding Zinpro or zinc methionine. And we can talk about other cumulative traces. We can talk about proteinates or, um, you know, whatever the other ones are. Um, and, and I think we could probably see some of the same results. I just use Zinpro as an example because they have the most research out there and, you know, we can throw some numbers out. Uh, this is some research done down at Texas Tech, and they showed us this last year down at the Plains Nutrition. Um, what they found was zinc methionine, just the zinc portion of available for, added to Optiflex, increased live weight nine pounds over just Optiflex alone. So again, we're getting a response to the trace mineral over and above Optiflex, and that shows us about a nine and a quarter dollar profit on the cost of feeding available for for that 30-day period over and above Optiflex. And so what you're going to see, I think, in the next year or so between Kelly and I and Lyle, and we're going to talk about adding uh, zinc methionine or available for to the uh, K-Flex product and figure out what that cost is and make sure that everything works out. But I think we're going to present that to a lot of you as an option because I think there's data. If you're already eating available for your balance, you need to add that to the K-Flex. Then you got that taken care of. So my closing thoughts on the feedlot side, um, and these are things, things in addition to what I've talked about. Consider strongly metaphylactic antibiotic therapy. So when cattle come in, consider treating them with a macrolide such as Draxins, Actins, and Prevo, um, and then being aggressive with chlorotetracycline, especially calf feds, especially on wheat cattle. Um, cattle are too expensive anymore to try to save money on a few drugs. I realize that you show a lot of dollars out for drugs but it's a lot cheaper than having to treat a bunch of cattle again. There's great data out there to say a calf treated once for BRD has a big reduction in performance, and then just on and down the line. Okay. And when you're treating cattle, make sure you switch that up. Treat them with something. If it doesn't work, switch something else. If it doesn't work, shoot them. Um, <laughs> 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 but consider a metaphylactic therapy to try to get ahead of some of that. You don't have any problems. Um, Really consider parasite control. We talked about safeguard and cattle this morning. And the same thing applies to cattle off of grass, especially. Um, we see a reproduction response to generate those internal parasites that porons don't take care of, especially cattle off of grass, um, calves, or yearlings. Uh, bed cattle, actually, again, that NDSI 
SE data, a 25% improvement in feed to gain ratio, bedding cattle adequately. And, and then like I talked about, let's consider limit feeding and growing cattle, especially in the climate. Um, and we can sure talk more about that here in the future. So with that, I thank you. Um, I will accept any questions. Um, a real aggressive S plant program or an overly aggressive, could you do it good as feeding pop pop and flex? Say that again. If you had to get a real aggressive or overly aggressive implant, mm -hmm. could you do as good as the pop and flex? So the question is, if you're very aggressive with your implant program, do you do as good as OptiFlex? And the answer is no. Um, OptiFlex will return you, like I showed up there, a steer somewhere around $20, $23. The implant program, if you do a good job, will return you a better part of 100 So to me, those add to each other. If one doesn't replace the other, well, OptiFlex gave you some t-shirt. Uh, or well, an implant program gave you something about that flex, certainly. Yes, sir. Hey, do you want to speak to the 400 dollars back in the top of flex? I haven't tried it yet. Um, okay. There's not enough data out there yet for me to say that that's the way to go. We have a little bit of this there. The, the original data did this show that 400 milligrams returned any more profit. From the cost of feeding and the they have got some new stuff now that would suggest that it does, but I just don't know if it's hard enough to get it. And it hasn't been done enough for me to go to the guest positions. Not saying it won't work. I just think we need a little bit more information first before you jump in. If you want to jump in, I'll set it up. I'll let you go. That free coffee? Free coffee, you said? Oh, yeah. Last <laughs> 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 Anybody else? Uh, there's no more questions. Um, we'll go ahead and try to do a quick panel session with Sam, Jeremy, and, and Dan. So if there's any questions or any other conversation that maybe we missed or would like to try to, to cover yet this afternoon, um, 